And he is worthy even when life is not pleasant for us. Even when circumstances are not good, our Lord is worthy of our praise. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 63 in which David, inspired by the Spirit of God, wrote, O God, you are my God, I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I'll bless you as long as I live. I'll lift up my hands in your name and my soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, for you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. My soul cleaves or clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They'll be delivered over to the power of the sword. They'll be a prey for foxes. But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by God will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Lord, we say, we affirm what we have just sung. You are worthy to receive our praise and honor and blessing because you are the perfect, eternal, holy one. You indeed are the holy one of God. You are the beloved son of God, the son of man, the Messiah, the the second person of the triune Godhead. And Lord, we worship you. We recognize we live in a world that disregards you, that despises you, but we love you and we bow before you and we recognize that you indeed are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we have come to worship you in our, in our giving, our financial giving, to say we are, we are responsive to your kindness to us and we give out of grace having been saved by grace and we worship you by our songs of praise and we worship you by hearing the word of God and then doing the word of God so we pray Lord as the Bible is about to be open to us give us ears to hear may the spirit of God guide us into all truth may he give us wisdom to know how to apply your word to our lives. We pray for those who need salvation, that you will show them their need for salvation and then draw them to yourself. Those who need encouragement, we ask you to do that. Those who need rebuke and uh, reproof, we pray you'll do exactly that. So Lord, glorify your name because we ask this, knowing that this is your will, that your people bring glory to you. This we pray in Christ's name, amen. Watching and waiting our whole life through For the moment when we arrive in glory We'll be standing before His emerald throne Oh, what a day it will be When all tears are gone and suffering ceased Perfect new life with no earthly strife, for we finish the race, run to his embrace. Oh, what a day that will be when we've arrived, stunned and surprised, all things resolved in the blink of an eye. No more distractions, no sin left to fight. The first glimpse of Jesus and faith becomes sight. Feel the ground shake, hear thunder roll, see blinding light and seraphim flight. All amazed we will fall. The Father will call, stand, I have made you my own. A choir with angels, martyrs, and saints, 
sing his praise with no end to the day shouting holy 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 to almighty god oh what a song that will be when we arrive sun and surprise all things resolved in the blink of The first glimpse of Jesus and faith When we've arrived, stunned and surprised All things resolve in the blink of an eye No more distraction, no sin left to fight The first glimpse of Jesus the first glimpse of Jesus, the first glimpse of Jesus and faith becomes sight. Won't that be a wonderful day? It is customary in certain parts of China for food and water to be laid in the casket of a recently deceased individual. Now this no doubt has to do with pagan and superstitious beliefs, but what would we find if we dug up that casket in a few days? Well, most likely we would find some worms and insects enjoying the food and water but we would certainly find the food and water unused by the corpse. And the reason is obvious. Dead people don't hunger and thirst anymore for anything. Hungering for food, thirsting for water is just something that's uniquely reserved for the living. That's obvious. Likewise, in the Sermon on the Mount, which we began to study last week, Jesus revealed that citizens of his kingdom are marked by a hunger and a thirst for something that is uniquely reserved for them, and them alone. No one else craves it. No one else longs for it. No one outside of believers in Christ even have an interest in it, let alone an appetite for it. What do you suppose it is that citizens of the kingdom desire that others don't? Well, here's what Jesus said in the second blessing, commonly referred to as a beatitude, which comes from the Latin word for blessed. He said this in Luke chapter 6, verse 21, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Now, this doesn't actually tell us what citizens of the, king, of the kingdom hunger for, so we need to just stop for a moment, take a step back, and think about last week's sermon. As you'll recall from last Sunday's message, Jesus began his sermon by stating, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And what we discovered in our study is that when we look at Matthew's larger account of this very same sermon, we learn that the poor who Jesus had in mind weren't those who were economically poor, but rather those who were spiritually poor. They were poor, as Jesus put it, in spirit. Meaning, those who recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt, that they are spiritually destitute, that they have absolutely nothing in and of themselves that would commend them to God, and that they're only deserving of God's wrath and judgment, those are the ones who recognize that they are spiritually poor. In other words, Jesus is referring to those who, knowing their sinful condition, their sinful hearts, their utter depravity, they're aware that they have absolutely no resources within themselves to merit God's favor. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's why Jesus called them blessed. Another word, a synonym for this would be approved by God. Why? Because knowing that they are spiritually bankrupt, they have believed on Christ for their salvation. They have trusted Christ for their salvation so that they are now in a right relationship with God and therefore they are citizens of his kingdom. 
Now, as I emphasized to you last week, you cannot enter God's kingdom unless you know that you're poor in spirit because the way into his kingdom is only through an acknowledgement that you have absolutely no right to be there because you have no righteousness in you. You're spiritually destitute. So, folks, here's how it works. Recognizing your spiritual poverty in brokenness and repentance, you come to God seeking his merciful forgiveness through Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross. And what does God do when you come like that? Well, he grants you complete forgiveness because Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and he who comes to me I will never cast away. And that's how you entered the kingdom of heaven. If you're a believer, that's how you entered it. With humble and crushed hearts, bowing low before Christ as king, admitting that you are a vile, wretched sinner, deserving the eternal wrath and judgment of Almighty God. The very moment you repented of your sin and you received God's forgiveness in Christ, God transferred you from the kingdom of darkness, which you had been in all of your life, to the kingdom of his beloved son, so that you are now literally a citizen of Christ's kingdom, and you will be for all of eternity. Now listen very closely. Upon entering the kingdom as a destitute sinner, one of the first things you noticed is that you had new attitudes. Things were changing. New desires, new longings in your heart. Instead of pursuing sin and rebelling against God, which is what you had done all of your life, you now found yourself wanting, even longing, craving, hungering to obey God. Folks, that's exactly why Luke records Jesus stating in his sermon these words, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Now, once again, just as we did in the first blessing uttered by Jesus, we have to be careful how we interpret these words, because just as there is no biblical teaching that says that financial poverty is a blessing, likewise, there is no biblical teaching that says being hungry for food is a blessing. However, when we turn to Matthew's longer version of this sermon, we discover that what Jesus was referring to was a spiritual hunger and thirst rather than a physical hunger and thirst. Specifically, He's referring to a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. In Matthew 5, 6, we get the fuller statement that Jesus made in his sermon, which is this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom, or for they shall be satisfied. Now, I want to explain something that's very important, and I think it'll help you to understand why Jesus said these words about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. See, if you are a believer in Christ just prior to entering the kingdom of God. The Lord did something very special in your life while in the process of convicting you of your sin and drawing you to Jesus Christ. He did a miraculous, supernatural work in your heart, which the Bible refers to as regeneration, commonly known as being born again. It's the same thing. Essentially, what that means is that he implanted spiritual life in you, his life, by giving you a brand new nature. Peter refers to this in 2 Peter 1 verse 4 as being a partaker of the divine nature. The new nature is a divine nature. And as a result of becoming a partaker of this new divine nature, you now find yourself being changed on the inside. Though you still struggle, with your sin, as we all do, as a regenerated citizen of the kingdom, you recognize that you do have new and different attitudes than you had before you were saved. You have new desires, you have new ambitions, you have new goals, new values, new morals, and pursuits that you never used to have. And to your surprise, you find that the primary pursuit of your life, what's most important to you now, is the pursuit of righteousness. And folks, that's exactly why Jesus said in this beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, 
I find this fascinating. It's fascinating because the very thing that is a rebellious, bankrupt sinner that we once lacked and we had absolutely no interest in, righteousness, now we hunger and thirst for it. We can't get enough of it. Prior to our conversion, righteousness was just a non-issue in our lives. We didn't care about it. We weren't interested in it. But as citizens of the kingdom, as I said, we just can't get enough of it. Now it's the driving force in our lives, so much so that we hunger and we thirst for it. And so this morning, as we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to explore not only what it means to hunger and to thirst for righteousness, but also how to apply this truth to our lives. And to do this, I'm going to ask three questions, which I will proceed to answer from the text and other scriptures to bring out the meaning of our Lord's words. With the question, first question being this, what kind of righteousness was Jesus referring to? Now, it's obvious that the key word in our Lord's statement is the word righteousness. Unlock the meaning of this term as the Lord was using it, and you'll understand what Jesus was talking about. Now, in Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, this is the first time that righteousness comes up in the sermon. But it's not the last time, because this concept of righteousness is one of the major themes found throughout the Sermon on the Mount. You don't see this in Luke, you do see it in Matthew. For example, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Jesus said that Christians are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. From Matthew 5.20, we learn that true righteousness has to go beyond the external trappings of religious behavior that the Pharisees had. It's something that's internal. It stems from proper motives. Jesus said your, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. In Matthew 6.1, Jesus warned us not to practice righteous deeds in front of others, to be noticed by them so that they'll think highly of us. And in Matthew 6.33, Jesus said that pursuing righteousness and not material good should be the first priority of our lives. That very famous statement, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. So it's very clear from these verses in Matthew's version of our Lord's sermon that righteousness plays an important role in the believer's life. Therefore, it's critical that we understand exactly what Jesus meant by this term righteousness. After all, you really can't hunger and thirst for righteousness if you don't know what it is. So to begin with, we need to understand how Jesus was using this term righteousness. You see, when the Bible speaks of righteousness as it relates to people, it can mean one of two things, depending on which kind of person it has reference to. First of all, there is what we call legal righteousness. This is the righteousness needed by all unbelievers. And the reason for this is because every individual born into this world is a sinner without any righteousness of their own. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. Therefore, an unbeliever's greatest need is for this legal righteousness in order to stand before a perfectly holy God and not be condemned for our sins. Based on what scripture teaches, theologians have a name for this, this kind of legal righteousness. They refer to it as imputed righteousness, which simply means that the moment a person trusts Christ for salvation, God legally imputes or reckons or credits, the same thing, Christ's righteousness to that individual. Paul wrote of this, this imputed righteousness in 2 Corinthians 5.21 when he said these glorious words. He made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now the biblical name for this legal transaction, this legal righteousness, this imputed righteousness, the biblical name for this is justification, which means that God declares the guilty sinner righteous in his sight. Now, this doesn't mean that the believer's behavior is always righteous, not at all, but rather that he is now legally righteous because Christ's righteousness of perfect obedience to the law of God has been credited to the believer's account. Now, understand this isn't something that we feel. It isn't something that we subjectively experience. 
It's something that God does on our behalf at the time of our salvation, and he does it unbeknownst to us. The Apostle Paul actually devoted the main portion of his letter to the Romans to address man's need for objective legal righteousness. And he wrote about his own experience with this imputed righteousness. He said this in Philippians 3, 9, speaking of himself, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul recognized eventually that all of his good deeds, all of his pharisaical observances were not righteous at all. He needed the righteousness of the Messiah to be put on his account, and he got it the moment he trusted Christ for salvation. Sadly, though, many religious Jewish people in Paul's time were not saved like he was, though interestingly, many Gentile pagans were. Paul writes of this in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 30. He says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attain righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, meaning the Jewish people, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, this is Christ himself, of stumbling, a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. See, most Jewish people of the first century, they failed to attain God's righteousness because they sought to establish their own righteousness. How? By trying to keep the law of Moses. And more often than not, trying to keep man's interpretations of the law of Moses. And I say this because there are many people today, especially religious people, people who regularly go to church, who are still trying to do the same thing. They think that by attempting to live by the Ten Commandments, by attempting to live an upright moral life as a good citizen, that they will somehow attain to a level of acceptable righteousness before God, and he'll say, you're wonderful, let me let you into my kingdom. But God says, as I said before, there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of of God, that is the standard of his perfection. And that's why the only way that we can be right with God is by legally having Christ's righteousness imputed to us. And that comes by faith, trust in Christ's death, and Christ alone for our salvation. See, though we are guilty of disobeying God's moral laws, Jesus Christ perfectly obeyed them. That's why he's worthy to receive all praise and glory, and none of us are. He obeyed the law of God perfectly, and the moment we turn to him for our salvation, not only does God completely forgive all of our sins, but he declares us that we are righteous in his sight. We are as righteous in his sight as Jesus Christ is, because he has mercifully imputed Christ's righteousness to our account. Now, folks, that is legal righteousness. Christ's perfect righteousness placed on the account of a sinner who has trusted him for salvation. It is the very foundation of the gospel because it is the most important need that every unbeliever has. However, as essential and as critical as imputed righteousness is, it is not the type of righteousness that Jesus was referring to in his statement about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. See, the type of righteousness that Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, note this, he's referring to practical righteousness, a moment-by-moment inner desire stemming from a regenerated heart and life, a transformed heart and life, to live in conformity to God's righteous will as revealed in his word. And this type of righteousness pertains only to believers and and not unbelievers at all. They're not interested in this. Now keep in mind, as you learned last week, those Jesus was referring to who said they were blessed or approved by God, they're believers. That's who he's talking about. They're citizens of his kingdom. Therefore, what our Lord is doing, he is declaring statements of fact. He's not telling them to do anything. He's not commanding us to do anything. He's just making statements of fact, telling us what characterizes someone who is a disciple of his. 
someone who's a true believer. That's what the Beatitudes are about. In other words, those Jesus calls blessed, they have certain characteristics that mark them as Christ followers, and therefore hungering and thirsting after righteousness, it's one of those characteristics. Another way of putting this is to say that all true Christians seek to live by God's righteous standards, by doing his righteous will as revealed in his righteous word. And, and this is how we know that, right, that the righteousness that Jesus is talking about, it can't be imputed righteousness, because imputed righteousness isn't something that, that believers need to seek. We already have it. We have it. But practical righteousness, a moment-by-moment -moment pursuit of obeying Christ, that's what drives all true Christians. You see, because every true Christian has this divine nature implanted within them at the time of regeneration, the time of salvation, they want to obey him. We long to obey. We long to grow in Christ. We want to be conformed to his image. In fact, a desire to obey the word of God, that's one of the ways that God assures us that we've been saved. If you struggle with assurance of salvation, you need to read 1 John, because in 1 John, the whole letter is about how you may know that you have eternal life. There are certain objective things that you can look at in your life to see, do I follow this? Do I behave like this? Do I have this attitude? Do I love people? Do I obey? If these things are true in your life, John says, inspired by the Spirit of God, then you can know that you have eternal life. And one of the things he says is found in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 3. By this, notice he says, by this we know that we have come to know him. By this we know that we're saved. If we keep his commandments, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we're in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as, as he walked. Now, this needs some explanation. John says that we know that we have come to know Christ. We, we know that we're saved if we keep his commandments. It's important to understand John is not saying that the only way you can have assurance of salvation is if you keep perfectly his commandments, because nobody keeps perfectly his commandments. And we know that that can't be what John is saying because just prior to this, if you look back at 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, John said this, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just or righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now he's talking here, just, just the verses leading up to the one about keeping his commandments, you're talking about the normal experience that every single Christian has. We sin, we hate our sin, we repent, we confess our sin, and sometimes we do it again rather quickly. But we go through the process. We confess our sins and we receive his cleansing forgiveness. So John couldn't possibly be referring to perfect obedience as the way to have assurance of salvation when he's just said, that the normal experience for all of us is that we sin. So here's what helps us to understand what John is talking about, and this will help you in assurance of salvation. For some, it may be startling to realize I'm not saved. So listen closely. The word that John uses that's translated keep or keeping, as in keeping his commandments, has the thought of observation, of watchfulness, in the sense of being on the lookout to obey God, wanting to obey him, looking to obey him, having a desire to obey him, even though you may fail many times. There's this desire in your heart to obey the word of God, even when you blow it, you desire it. So he's talking about someone who longs to obey scripture, even though he may struggle with sin. Now, if you are never, and I mean never, interested in obeying God's word. If the Bible just doesn't matter to you, you hear what God says and you go and you just disregard it, it doesn't have any impact on your life, then you have never been converted. That's what John is saying. Because those who know Christ, because of this new nature within them, they want to obey him. That's 
the mark of being a true Christian, the mark of someone who's a citizen of Christ's kingdom. Even though you may struggle with sin, you still desire to obey him. If you don't have this desire at all, you're not a Christian. If you have this desire to obey him, you are a Christian because it is the evidence of a new divine nature having been implanted in you. You see, having entered Christ's kingdom, we are not content to simply be in the kingdom, be saved on our way to heaven. We want something more. We want to follow Jesus as closely as possible. We want to know him better. We want to obey him. We want to walk as close as we possibly can in fellowship with him. We want to live by his truths. We want to submit to his authority in our lives. This desire for obedience, this desire for spiritual growth, this desire for spiritual intimacy with Christ then becomes the driving force of our lives. And folks, that's essentially what it means to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Here's what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, how he explained it. He said, the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness is the man who wants to exemplify the Beatitudes in his daily life. He's a man who wants to show the fruit of the Spirit in his every action and in the whole of his life and activity. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is to long to be like the New Testament man, the new man in Christ. That's what it means, that the whole of my being, the whole of my life shall be like that. Now note this, note this carefully. What Lloyd-Jones is describing here is nothing more than the normal Christian life, not some kind of a deeper spiritual life for a select group of Christians who have just happened to have figured it out, how to live on a higher sanctified plane than the rest of us. Not at all. This is the way it is for every Christian so that all who come to Christ as bankrupt sinners with no righteousness of their own, they are transformed by the Lord and to those whose main goal in life now is to obey his righteous commands. This is a critical truth, folks, for us to understand. I'll tell you why. The reason being is that there is a dangerous teaching held to by some within evangelical circles that says that, yes, you can have Christ as Savior, but you don't have to submit to him as your Lord. In other words, you, yes, you must trust him to save you, to take you to heaven, but it's optional. If you want to obey him here on earth, it's optional. But friends, that statement by Jesus, what Jesus is teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount, he's teaching just the opposite of that. Jesus says that if a person is a genuine citizen of Christ's kingdom, then his life will be characterized by a pursuit of obedience to God's word. Remember, he's not commanding us to do anything here. He is simply stating it as fact. Now listen, until a few years ago, this truth that believers are marked, that all believers are marked by a desire to obey God's word, it was held to by virtually all who have embraced orthodox biblical Christianity. Here's just a, a sampling of how a few respectable Bible teachers in, in different countries have reacted to the erroneous view that obedience doesn't have to characterize a Christian. First of all, there's contemporary English Bible teacher, John Blanchard, who wrote these words. To say that a person can be converted without being changed is not merely bad theology, it is gobbledygook. Let me translate gobbledygook for you. It's similar to the English, great English expression, mumbo jumbo. In Americanese, we would say nonsense, gibberish. He's right. In the late 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, he wrote in one of his books on evangelism, these words, another proof of the conquest of a soul for Christ will be found in a change, a change of life. If the man does not live differently from what he did before, both at home and abroad, his repentance needs to be repented of and his conversion is a fiction. Then there's the German reformer Martin Luther who after coming to an understanding of salvation by faith alone, he was once confronted by someone who said to him, if this is true, meaning salvation by faith alone, if this is true, a person could simply live as he pleased. To which Luther responded, indeed, now what pleases you? In other words, yes, he's saying a true believer will indeed do as he pleases, but what now pleases him is obeying the word of God. 
He's exactly right. Now, as I said earlier, if it's not your earnest desire to please God by obeying his word, then you need to recognize that you have never been converted. I'm not talking about struggling. I'm talking about you don't have a desire at all. You've not been converted. You need to examine your heart. You need to come to faith in Christ. Listen to what King David said in Psalm 40, verse 8. I desire to do your will. Oh, my God, your law is within my heart. And you catch that. David said that the reason he desired to do God's will was because God had written his law in David's heart. In other words, David was given a new heart, a new nature that, he, that, that made him now inclined to obey God's law. This is an Old Testament reference to regeneration. The word is not used here, but this is what he's talking about. That new nature That change of heart God gives us. He gave it to believers in the Old Testament. He gives it to New Testament era believers today. And that's why we desire righteousness, just like David did. Now, going back to the statement Jesus made in his sermon about righteousness, I want you to notice something important. I want you to notice that Jesus didn't say that citizens of his kingdom merely desire, merely want righteousness. He said that they hunger and they thirst for righteousness. That leads us then to ask a second question, simply this, what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? We know he's talking about practical, moment by moment, daily obedience, but what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Notice that our Lord purposely conveyed this statement about righteousness in words that were intense and extreme. You see, to hunger for food and to thirst for water, these were concepts that our Lord's first century Jewish audience, those listening to him on that, on that hill that day near the Sea of Galilee, they were very familiar with a need for water, a need for food. Unlike most of us who think of hunger as missing a meal or two, these people were very poor and they often lived on the border of starvation. And living in a hot and dry climate with water being very limited, and in short supply, they knew what it was like to need a drink just to survive, just to stay hydrated. In fact, a little later in Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord will directly address the anxiety that these folks had over wondering if they had enough food and enough water. He'll say in Matthew 6, 25, for this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. See, hungering and thirsting was something that they, they were quite anxious over because they, they did hunger, they did thirst. It was a way of life to these people. They didn't know if they were going to have enough food to survive. They didn't know if they were going to have enough drink to make it. They often found themselves desperate for food and water. And it's in those terms of desperation that Jesus said that citizens of his kingdom long for righteousness, so much so that he compared the desire of his people that they have for righteousness with the intense longing that a starving man has for food, a dehydrated man has for water. The Bible refers to this this kind of spiritual longing in a number of places, and it's in these places in Scripture that help us to understand exactly what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Listen to David as he cries out to God in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Again, in Psalm 63, verse 1. O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Now notice... Notice what David is specifically crying out for. He craves fellowship with God. He he longs for spiritual intimacy with God. He needs God like a starving and dehydrated man need food and water. He is panting for God. He's hungry for him. He can't stand the thought of living apart from God, being out of fellowship with God. He lives to know the Lord and to enjoy his fellowship, his presence, his smile. Likewise, in Psalm 119, verse 131, the psalmist expressed the same thing when he wrote these words, I opened my mouth wide and panted 
for I longed for your commandments. So like David, this man, this man had such a yearning to walk with God that like a thirsty animal panting for water, he panted for the word of God. Now folks, this is what Jesus means by hungering and thirsting for righteousness. He isn't referring to a half-hearted effort to obey his word when it's convenient for you. He's saying that true believers can't live without him. They have to fellowship with Christ. They have to obey him. They They have to live for him. That honoring him is the priority of their lives. That they demonstrate all of this by pursuing righteousness like a starving man pursues food. Now, the question is, is this your heartfelt desire? Does the thought of not being in fellowship with Christ, even for just a little while, bother you more than anything else? Do you long to honor him? Do you long to obey him with your life? Do you even think about that? The Apostle Paul spoke of this as his own experience in Philippians 3.10 when he said, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Here's Paul crying out years after coming to to Christ. Oh, that I may know him. Paul longed to know him better. Paul longed to be more mature in Christ. This is the great apostle Paul who said, I have not arrived. I'm constantly pursuing him. The apostle Peter closes his second letter by exhorting us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't be content to just be a Christian. Grow in grace. Grow in knowledge. It's not enough to just be introduced to Christ at salvation. The true believer is driven to know him better, to grow in him, to be more like him, to be closer to him, to be more consistent in obeying him. This is the normal experience of those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. However, if we are honest, we would have to admit that though, yes, I know I'm a Christian, but there are times when I just don't have this kind of appetite for the Lord's fellowship. I don't have this appetite for the Lord, for spiritual growth, for obeying scripture. I know I should, but I don't. One Bible teacher commenting about the state of the contemporary church and the lack of hungering and thirsting for righteousness amongst Christians, he wrote these words. And he wrote them, I might add, several years ago. He said, one of the greatest signs of sickness in the Christian church today is the widespread lack of hungering and thirsting after God. One can often measure this by dwindling attendances at evening services. Many churches have dropped an evening service altogether because of a lack of interest. Surely, this lack of appetite is a sign of sickness. The same shows itself in the behavior of some people when they come, when they do come to church. They seem restless, fidgety, or listless. They barely sing the hymns, rarely open a Bible in order to follow the reading, and often seem to treat the sermon as a lullaby. Others seem more interested in a musical presentation or drama than in the preaching of the word. A pastor friend of mine once told me, for many people in our churches today, Christianity has become a spectator sport. Now he was speaking of those who attend church, not so that they, not so that their spiritual hunger might be met by the living God, but so that their religious feelings might be massaged, preferably to music. Now, folks, I told you that that was written a number of years ago because I want you to know that things have gotten even worse since this Bible teacher wrote of this. Ever since COVID, there are many Christians who don't even come to church anymore, let alone the evening service. They don't come to the morning or evening service, though they are physically able to do this. They choose rather to either stay at home and watch the church service on live stream, or maybe just not at all. Maybe not at all. Now listen, talk about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. This is just the opposite It's blatant disobedience to Christ, to one of the most basic commands of the New Testament. This is not graduate school commands. This is elementary school. Be in church. This is basic. It's clearly commanded in the New Testament to gather with other believers on Sundays in church. It's not a debatable issue. People aren't arguing about this. 
There isn't someone who says, well, I have a different interpretation. Everybody agrees this is what it means when the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God doesn't present attending church as an option. Folks, it's a command from him. Don't forsake assembling yourselves together. I don't know how we can make it any clearer. To not do this when you are physically capable of doing this, it is just brazen disobedience. It is completely contrary to what our Lord is teaching that we should hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now maybe this lack of obedience in general, not just church but in general, uh, that Jesus is talking about, maybe it describes your life now, but it wasn't always this way. You once, as you look back at your life, you once had a craving for him in the past, but now your appetite has diminished. Looking back at your life, you remember when you first came to Christ, you, you couldn't get enough of Jesus. You couldn't get enough of his word. You devoured it. As Kent Hughes puts it, he said, you were joyously desperate for the things of God. But not anymore. Your spiritual appetite is so small these days, and the question is why? And more importantly, how can you get this appetite back for him? Well, Peter tells us how to get this appetite back. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, <coughs> here's what we read in verses 2 and 3. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now, in these two verses, Peter addresses those who have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And what he means by this is that at salvation, you tasted God's grace and mercy in Christ. You tasted it. You were introduced to Christ. You came to faith in Christ. However, to go beyond tasting so that you grow spiritually, so that you mature spiritually... Peter tells us that we need to crave God's word with the same kind of intensity that a newborn infant longs for its mother's milk. But watch this. Just prior to saying this, Peter reveals in verse 1 why some believers don't have this kind of spiritual intensity and hunger anymore. Why their appetite is not there. He says, therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word. What Peter is saying is that you will not have an appetite for righteousness. You will not have an appetite for scripture. You will not have an appetite to follow Christ if you are constantly feeding on sinful thoughts, sinful attitudes, sinful deeds. In other words, you need to remove the spiritual junk food from your diet, and then you'll get your appetite back. He's talking about repenting. Get rid of that stuff. Lay it aside. Whatever stinky attitude you have towards somebody or towards something, get rid of it. Repent of it. Whatever thing you're doing that's wrong, that you know is wrong, like not attending church when you're capable of it, lay that aside and do what's right. And when you do that, your appetite will come back. You'll have a hunger. You'll have a thirst. So what this simply means is that there are sins that you need to repent of. Turn from them. Forsake them. Establish new patterns of thinking and new patterns of living. As I said, when you change your spiritual diet by laying aside sinful junk food, your appetite for righteousness will come back. So the question is, what do you need to lay aside? What sinful thoughts have you been feeding on? What sinful attitudes? What sinful behavior? Forsake them and return to longing for the pure milk of the word. It is sin and sin alone that keeps you from having a hunger and thirst for righteousness like you should. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that citizens of the kingdom, they do hunger and do thirst for daily practical righteousness. We've learned that this hunger, this thirsting, comes by seeking spiritual intimacy, closeness with the Lord, and if you don't have an appetite for, for this, it's only because you've allowed sinful attitudes and behavior 
to enter into your life. And this brings us then to our third and final question. What is the result of hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Now, Jesus very plainly said that those who hunger, those who thirst for righteousness, he said, would be satisfied. What does he mean by that? Well, the Greek word that is used here for satisfied was a word often used in other Greek literature of fattening animals, fattening them up with food so that they, they couldn't eat anymore. They, what we would say is that they're stuffed. In other words, the thought here is that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be completely, fully satisfied, meaning that those who long to be close to Jesus, those who long to fellowship with Jesus, those who long to be in submission and obedience to Jesus, you'll be fully satisfied with Jesus. Our Lord, if you recall, he told the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Never thirst. Listen, there is a satisfaction of soul that only Jesus Christ can give. He gives it to us initially at our conversion, and then he keeps giving it to us as we keep seeking him and growing in him. But here's the strange thing. It's one of the oddities of the Christian life. It's this, though Jesus satisfies you, you still keep hungering and thirsting for more. That is a paradox. A paradox is an apparent contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. This is a paradox. How can you experience hunger and satisfaction at the same time? But you can, and you do. It's similar to eating your favorite food. You can eat it until you're completely satisfied, yet, there's always a yet there. Yet, even though you are full, you're satisfied, you still have a taste for that food. You still want more because you find that food so enjoyable, so satisfying, it makes you want more. In the same way, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they find it so satisfying, they want more of it. Listen, if you're a citizen of Jesus Christ's kingdom, someone who's truly been converted, then you will hunger and you will thirst for him and he will satisfy you. He says in his word, Psalm 107, verse 9, for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. He does satisfy. But if you're not one of Christ's followers, I'm telling you, you will never be satisfied. There'll never be satisfaction in your soul until you come to faith in Christ. Financial success will never satisfy your soul, no matter how much money you have. Physical pleasures will never satisfy your soul. Success in school, success in business, a career will not satisfy your soul. Achievements on the athletic field, as exciting as those might be, they will never satisfy your soul. Even meaningful relationships, as important as those are, they'll never satisfy you, truly satisfy you. It's only in knowing Christ and in growing in Christ that you will find ultimate satisfaction. So make sure that you're a citizen of Christ's kingdom. Examine your life to see, do I really care about righteous obedience to Christ? Do I really desire this? Listen, if you know that you're doing things that are wrong, you know that they're wrong, they know, you know that they displease the Lord, and you don't care enough to change, then you're not a true believer. True believers make those changes. They repent. You may have made a profession of faith in Christ. You may have made it years ago. But the evidence, the evidence that your faith is real, that you've truly been converted, is that you desire to obey the Word of God, Christ, from the Word. Without this desire, you reveal something about yourself that you have never been saved. You don't have a new nature. You just have an old sin nature. And all that old sin nature wants to do is sin. So repent. Place your trust in Christ alone for salvation now. And as I try to do every Sunday morning, I, I invite you, if you'd like to speak to one of our pastors about this, and just see me as we close the service. Now, if you are a citizen of his kingdom, 
then thank God that he's transformed you. You didn't do this on your own. He transformed you so that you, you now hunger and thirst for righteousness. If he doesn't put that nature within you, you don't have that desire. So give him praise for it. And if your appetite these days for the things of God is not what it should be, then put aside any sin you're aware of that's ruining your appetite. Get back on track spiritually. You can do it. If you're a believer, God has given you the power to do it. So do it. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for these critical words. And Lord, as we have examined them and unfolded them and looked at them from so many different angles, we pray that your word would have an impact on our lives. I pray, Lord, for those who have perhaps thought that they are Christians, but they don't have any interest in the things of God. They don't care about obeying you. I pray that they will be honest with themselves as they examine their lives and that they will realize that they're not saved. And I pray that they will come to faith in you, that you'll draw them to yourself. And Lord, for those who, um, who they're disobedient, for those who could come to church in particular but have chosen not to, I pray you'll convict them of sin, that this is wrong. And I pray that they'll make no excuses, but they'll start uh, even next week returning. I pray, Lord, for those who have other sins in their lives, attitudes, actions, behavior, words perhaps. Uh, I pray that you'll convict them. They'll lay those things aside and the appetite for you will return. And Lord, for all of us, give us, give us a, a deeper longing than ever before to know you, to, uh, to be in fellowship with you, to be as intimate with you as we possibly can. All of this we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful day. Hope we'll see you tonight as we study the word together. You're dismissed.